Welcome back to Mom and Mind, everyone. I am so glad you're here with us. I am host of Mom and Mind podcast, Dr. Kat. Sharing personal stories on this podcast is a huge part of our platform. And we do hear a lot about postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety and sometimes some of the other conditions that come through. But what we hear less about are the stories of people who have gone through experiences that in general are talked about less and heard about less and a little less understood. So I'm always very grateful for people who are coming on to share their story, to help spread a little bit of information, some education and compassion to those conditions that, that are a little bit more misunderstood by the general population. And today we are going to hear a personal story from Jessica Eckhoff, who experienced a postpartum onset bipolar disorder, which resulted in the experience of postpartum psychosis for her. And she walks us through parts of her story that are pretty difficult, um, difficult for the person who are experiencing them. And I want to let everyone know who is listening today that this is an important story to know and to hear and to understand because this happens. It happens for mothers. It happens more than we are led to believe. And we need to know that this is a possibility. Um, Providers need to know that this is a possibility so that we can more adequately support people who might be experiencing these symptoms. What Jessica has done since she went through this and has um, figured out her own healing and recovery is now she's written a memoir called Super Sad Unicorn, a memoir of mania. And this is an account of her experience with postpartum onset bipolar one disorder and psychosis. And this book will be published by New Degree Press in early 2023. But what she's also done with her experience is partnered with Postpartum Support International to become a peer facilitator for pregnant and postpartum women with bipolar disorder. And let me tell you, there are very few resources for women who are experiencing this. So I'm so incredibly grateful to her and PSI for creating this resource. By day, Jessica is a trademark advertising attorney. And by night, she's a figure skating, board game, and fiction enthusiast. She lives in Chicago with her husband and their toddler son. And in Jessica's story today, you're going to hear a little bit about her experience with mania and psychosis starting just a few days after her son was born. And she'll walk us through parts of her experience in the psychiatric ward when she was 10 days postpartum and what that felt like for her, what her experience was and what it's like to be in that state of mind as opposed to what like someone on the outside might see or experience of it. Again, I'm so grateful to Jessica for being on with us. So let's meet Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're coming on to share your story, um, especially because although um, uh, postpartum onset bipolar does happen, uh, for sure, um, it's not widely talked about, which I'm, I'm sure you've experienced. Um, that there should be a lot more discussion about it um, and specifically to hear people's stories um, and to understand what goes on for them and how uh, the kind of help that people are able to get and, and you know, how healing can happen. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful uh, for you to start sharing your story wherever you feel comfortable. Okay. Well, it's a bit of a long story. There's lots of details, but I'll try to keep it relatively condensed kind of to the most important points. And I'll I'll quickly jump ahead to the end first and just say, I think the most important part is that I'm doing really well now. I am stable and I have been for over a year. I have a really good support system in place and lots of resources. And I'll kind of touch on some of those at the end too, so that people know about them. Um, but it was definitely a journey. It was a long journey. Um, and it started pretty immediately after my son was born. So um, I have a son whose name is Wells. He's 18 months old now. So he was a pandemic baby born in February of 2021. Mm-hmm. And I, prior to having him, I had um, no history of bipolar disorder, either for myself or for anybody in my family, um, immediate family or extended family, just no history whatsoever. Um, 
I did a lot of reading while I was pregnant. I feel like I read all the, you know, main pregnancy books and early parenthood books, and I never came across a single thing about postpartum onset bipolar disorder. I read a tiny bit about psychosis, but very little. Um, and what I did read was essentially, this is incredibly rare. It's not going to happen to you, so don't worry about it. Um, you know, it's, it's a one in 1000 thing. You're going to be fine. Um, but then unfortunately I was one of those one in 1000 and I was not prepared. Um, so I, I hope that, um, maybe by sharing my story, I can help avoid that situation for other people that they'll at least know kind of that it is a possibility and what to look for and what they should do if, if they feel like they're having psychosis. Yeah, for sure. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, my story, like I said, um, I started having symptoms pretty promptly. Looking back, I realized that I started entering a manic phase when my son was about two days old. And by the time he was four days old, it had gotten really serious. Um, I was not sleeping. I felt really energized. Um, my husband kept encouraging me to try and sleep when the baby was sleeping. And I just kept telling him like, no, no, there's just, there's so much to do. Um, I felt really productive. I was going around the house and making all these lists. I had post-it notes everywhere around the house of all these different tasks that I wanted to accomplish, um, including tasks that involved my work, um, even though I was on maternity leave. So I'm an attorney and I started having all these ideas for business development and how to get new clients and articles that I should be writing and all these things. So I had these post-it notes all over the house. I wasn't sleeping at all. When my son was four days old, it was, you know, like I think nine or 10 o'clock at night, I was upstairs. He was downstairs with the baby and he came up to tell me, you know, that the baby was hungry and it was time to feed him. And I just went into this rage and started screaming about, you know, how dare he just tell me that I needed to, you know, breastfeed whenever he said so. I was breastfeeding at the time. Um, and, you know, I'm more than just a milk machine. I'm a lawyer and I'm a really successful lawyer. And how dare you just distill me down into my boobs and nothing else and just mm -hmm. screaming. And that was completely out of character for me. I am not a yeller. Um, I'm definitely not a yeller at my husband. I'm not sure I've raised my voice to him in the 15 years we've been together. So mm -hmm. it was immediately clear that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so he, you know, asked me to call my parents and have them come. Um, and help us. They live about three hours away. And I remember at the time thinking like, man, he is not adapting to new parenthood very well. It's only been four days. And here he's, you know, trying to bring in reinforcements already. Like this just seems kind of like overkill. But, you know, if he feels that stressed, then I guess I'll call them. So I called my parents. Um, I think from the way I was speaking during that call, I think they could also tell that something was wrong. Oh. They told me later, um, I was speaking really quickly and my voice sounded different and I kept going off on all these tangents and I just was not acting like myself. Mm -hmm. So they um, packed their bags that night and drove up. I live in Chicago. And by the time they got here, um, I had started having delusions that my husband had called DCFS and was trying to have our son taken away. So by the time my parents got here, there was a knock on the door and I thought it was DCFS. So I threw myself to the ground and I put a pillow over my head and I thought, you know, DCFS was coming to take my son. I'm just panicking. My husband lets them in and, you know, of course it's just my parents, but my mom walks in and there I am. And I'm just crumpled on the floor with this pillow over my head screaming. Mm -hmm. um, and that was when I was four days postpartum. So things got bad really quickly. quickly. Um, can I ask it, a, a question about yeah. that, um, that four days? Oh, yeah. It's looking back on it now, you can, you can speak about what was happening, but what did it feel like to you? So at the time, um, after the initial incident of kind of going off on the rage with my husband and yelling at him, I remember wake, you know, after it happened, it was almost as though I had blacked out. I sort of had mm. this vague recollection that maybe I had raised my voice and maybe my husband was a little upset, but it was as though I couldn't remember exactly what I had said. And the details came back to me later. Mm. Um, but in the moment, I couldn't really remember. So I thought my husband was overreacting when he asked me to call my parents. Mm. Um, and 
when I was having the delusions, I mean, I just remember feeling terror and fear. And I thought my baby was going to get taken away from me. Um, and it just, it felt very, very real. And looking back now, it's just, it's hard to believe that my brain could have done that. Um, you know, I have a really good relationship with my husband. There was no reason, you know, no rational reason to believe that he was trying to have my son taken away, but that's just what mania does and what psychosis does. And I just wasn't able to think rationally at that point. So I, I just felt terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that leads you up to when your, your parents got there. Um, and, uh, and so I assume they were worried this wasn't their, their daughter as they knew you. Yes, they were very, very worried. Um, then, so, you know, it was late at night by the time they arrived the next day, they started calling around, trying to figure out what kind of help I needed and what could be done. And fortunately, I have a friend who's a social worker. She knew about um, a perinatal intensive outpatient therapy program in the area. And so she suggested that I look into that. Um, my husband called them and he got me an appointment to do an intake interview, which I did. Um, and I was scheduled to start the program on that following Monday. I think I interviewed, I did the interview maybe like on a Thursday or Friday, mm -hmm. but things went downhill very, very quickly. And, um, unfortunately I ended up being hospitalized before I could start that program. Um, did I did ultimately do the program later. Um, yeah, I, I thank you. I want to come back to that. I'm curious if, um, what did you think about them uh, or your husband having you do this interview at the, at the time? Yeah, at the time, I, by that point, I, I kind of understood several other things had happened too. Um, I, I could tell that something was wrong. Um, I was having a really difficult time concentrating on anything. My thoughts were racing so quickly. I just, I couldn't think. And like one example of that that really stands out. I'm a big reader and a big audiobook listener. Mm -hmm. And I kept trying to listen to my audiobook and would get lost immediately. I kept mm -hmm. having to rewind and, you know, I would listen for like 30 seconds and then realize I had lost my train of thought and I would have to start over. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to go for a walk, um, you know, just to get outside. And I told my husband, um, you know, just keep an eye out the window for me. I'm a little worried that I might wander off the street and maybe I'll get lost and not be sure how to get home. I'm not sure. I just feel so scattered. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, it was, it was pretty severe and lots of other things happened to the, probably the, the most significant um, indicator to myself that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. I had fed my son and I was trying to, you know, take a couple minutes to myself afterwards. I was just sitting in our bedroom trying to decompress and just this panicky feeling came over me. Like something is really wrong. I don't know what it is, but I don't feel like myself. Something is happening. And I started, there was a notebook on my nightstand and I started writing down this list of ways um, that I could prove my identity and give my husband access to our joint um, emergency savings account because I thought I was going to need some sort of really significant treatment and maybe that was going to be very expensive and I needed to make sure that he could access that money. So I, I started writing down, you know, here's my name and here's who I'm married to and here's my birthday and my social security number and um, I'm an attorney. So here's my bar card. Here's my mom's maiden name. Just this long list. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote out, you know, my, you can find my signature, these different places in our home. Um, here's my signature here. So you can match it. Mm -hmm. um, this, this very long thing. Um, and I finished it and I kind of set it on, on my nightstand. And I, I came back an hour or two and looked at it and just thought, this looks like the ravings of a crazy person. Like this is, I, I can't believe that I did this. And I had done it, you know, an hour or two ago. Um, so when you came back to it, you were not in the same state of mind? No, I wasn't. Um, I I was definitely kind of fluctuating in and out of being lucid and not lucid. Um, and that, that was really kind of the case from day four until day 10, which is when I was hospitalized. Okay. Thank you for that. It, it, it's, um, 
I, I appreciate you walking us through a little bit of what it felt like inside because it, like the, your process inside is probably very different than what people are seeing externally. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, looking back on it, it's really much easier to put the pieces together. But for somebody who's going through it and who's experiencing what you're describing, there's just so much confusion and a difficulty like grasping and holding on to like parts of what you know to be your your day to day reality. Um, uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing the, the kind of internal experience that you were having there. Yeah, I mean, confusion is definitely the right word. It was just my thoughts were so jumbled and it was so hard to, like you said, hold on to anything. It was like every thought I had was just this fleeting thing and it would be gone instantly. And it was scary. I just, yeah. I felt like I was losing, you know, my my grasp on things. I developed a stutter too, which was also scary. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all in such a fast amount of time. So, so very fast this all happened. Um, so you, uh, you said by day 10, that's, um, when you went to the hospital. Yes. Um, I, by that point, um, I was having a lot of delusions. Um, I, the main delusion at that point was that I thought it was my husband who was having some type of mental health breakdown and I felt like I wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. So I locked myself in a closet. It was about two in the morning and I called a friend and begged her to come and pick me up and pick up Wells because I thought we weren't safe. Mm -hmm. And the friend that I called is a doctor. And so I, frankly, I think even if she wasn't a doctor, I'm sure she could have guessed something was wrong, but because she's a doctor, I, I think she probably had a better understanding of the types of things that I might be experiencing. Mm -hmm. So she was able to kind of calm me down a bit and convince me that, you know, it, it was two in the morning. It, it would really worry my husband, Dane, if I were to just leave in the middle of the night. Um, but she promised that if I still wanted to be picked up the next morning, she would come and get me. So that kind of calmed me down a bit. But then, you know, my husband came into the room and I started getting all worked up again. Um, I called his dad and told his dad that I thought, you know, he was having this mental health breakdown and I just didn't have the bandwidth to help him. And I needed his dad to do something. And I was just screaming and cursing, which is really unusual for me. And um, I think at that point, my husband, it was Saturday or Sunday, I think Sunday, maybe, and I was supposed to start that intensive therapy program the next day on Monday. But I think my husband determined it was just too severe and that I was potentially a danger to myself or others. And so he called 911. Um, when I heard him calling 911, because I thought he was the one having the crisis, I called 911 mm -hmm. um, to report him. So I, I was on the phone with 911 when the paramedics showed up um, to take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I mean, that that sounds like you were really afraid. Um, yes, I was very, very afraid at that point. Um, so when they came um, for for you, what happened? So I was still convinced that they were there for my husband. Um, so, you know, I, I got dressed and they asked me to come with them. And I, I thought they wanted me to come with them because they wanted me to be the support person for my husband because he was about to get admitted into the hospital. And, you know, they had me ride in the ambulance. And um, I thought to myself, it's, you know, it's a little strange they're having me ride in the ambulance, but they probably just want to make sure that I you know, make it to the right place within the hospital. And they, I guess they must have my husband in a different ambulance. You know, they're keeping us separate, maybe just to keep him calm or something like that. So we, we get to the hospital, we go inside um, and I'm taken into an examination room and it's a glass room with um, just an exam table inside and a small table and chairs. And, you know, they have me sit down and a nurse comes in and starts asking me, you know, a series of questions. And then they have um, another person come in who I now think I may have been a social worker or something like that came in and asked additional questions. And then they asked me to put on a hospital gown. And I said, okay, you know, I think this is going too far. I understand that, you know, you're, we're kind of doing this charade to keep my husband calm. And, you know, you're pretending like I'm the patient, but like, we all know that he's the patient. So I don't really think I need to get into this gown. Um, and they said, no, you know what, we, we really do need you to get in the gown. Could you please do that? And I remember thinking like, this is, 
this is really taking things too far, but you know, I, I love my husband. And if this is what they think is necessary to help him, then fine. Um, so I got into the gown and I sat back on the table and at that point they had my husband come in and he's still wearing his street clothes. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, that's so strange. Like they had, they made me get into the gown. He's the real patient. Why isn't he wearing the gown? Um, And we sit down and the doctor comes in and starts asking us both questions. And then he looks at us and he says, okay, I want you to both explain why you think you're here. And so I said, we're here because, you know, we just had a baby 10 days ago and my husband can't handle it. And he's had this break from reality. He's having a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. And the doctor looks at my husband and says, okay, why do you think you're here? And he says, because my wife is having a mental health crisis. And I remember looking at the doctor and saying, see, see, he's he's clearly crazy. He thinks that I'm the problem, but he's the problem. Mm -hmm. And the doctor just very kindly and very calmly looks at me and says, I know it's hard to understand right now, but we are actually here because of you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just was floored. Of course. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, it's just really, like you were saying before, amazing what the brain can do under this kind of duress um, to kind of try and make sense of everything. Um, And what I love about what your brain did is that you were just you were seeing the need for support for your husband and for whatever reason, that's, um, what happened, but gosh, how devastating. Um, and that's my assumption anyways, like devastating to hear that it's for you, that you're the person who needs the support. Yeah, it was, it was very devastating and just shocking. I had a really hard time wrapping my head around it. I, you know, I did ultimately come to terms with it, but, um, I was just, I was so, there was not a doubt in my mind that I was right. I was just certain that I was right and that it was my husband who was having the breakdown. And I just was floored when the doctor said it was me. Um, Did you still at that point have a hard time believing him or like, how did, yeah, what happened there? I have a lot of respect for medical professionals. And so I did believe him. Um, I, I was shocked, but I thought, you know, he's the doctor, he's the expert. Um, I do trust him to know. And so if he says, you know, I don't feel like I'm the problem, but if he says that I am, um, I guess that must be right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, at at that point, um, what happened? So at that point, um, they gave me a shot that, you know, a sedative. So I was able to sleep for a couple hours. Um, and then they transferred me upstairs into um, the psychiatric ward. And for the first couple days, I was in um, a mixed ward. So it was men and women. And when I first got to the ward, um, I think it, it must have been like, I think it was like afternoon quiet time. So everyone was in their rooms, um, but everyone's door was open. And I remember walking down the hallway and every patient that I saw was just like laying on their side in their bed in their hospital gown. And I remember thinking like, why am I the only one who's up and around? Um, and this led me to believe that I was in some sort of specialized um psychiatric facility that was like an escape room. Um, I'm really into board games. I love escape rooms. And I started having this delusion that I was in this specialized, you know, experimental therapy program. And it was based on an escape room. And all these people were actors. And at Mm -hmm. some point, you know, it was going to come to be their part in the escape room. And they were going to get out of their beds and come and interact with me. Mm -hmm. And there were going to be clues that I needed to solve. And I had to solve all the clues to get out of the psychiatric ward. So that was, that was the mindset that I was in. So I remember my first meal there, um, all the patients eat together in the day room and they give you this little piece of paper with the menu and you can pick what you want to eat for your meal. There were a few different options. And I remember looking at the menu and thinking that it was, it was a joke, like that it had inside jokes that were meant for me. For example, I remember one of the beverages on the menu was crystal light. And it didn't have the trademark registration symbol after it. And I'm a trademark lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was meant to be like an inside joke that would make me laugh. I thought, oh, you know, they must have called in Dane and asked for like some specific little facts about me. And then they designed this menu um, as a way to make me laugh. I also thought that there was some sort of improv comedy 
element to the escape room. Um, I did improv comedy for many years. So I thought that that was a component of what this therapy program was. Um, so I, you know, I turned around and I looked at the guy behind me and I said like, oh, these menus are great. Like, it's, it's fun that they made that for us. And I remember him looking at me kind of strangely and saying like, yeah, the, the menus are nice. Um, and, you know, he ended up coming over later and sitting at my table and we started talking and um, he told me that he was a university professor. And, you know, I told him that I was a lawyer and I remember him saying like, oh, like you're, you're a lawyer. You're, you know, there's not a lot of lawyers in this place. You're like a unicorn. Um, and so I, from that point on throughout my time in the ward started referring to myself as the unicorn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I told him, well, if I'm a unicorn, I'm a super sad unicorn who's, you know, locked in the psych ward and I have a baby at home and I don't even get to see him. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was, I, I later on, I know we'll talk about it later, but I wrote a memoir about my experience and it's called super sad unicorn. Yeah, um, thank you. I was going to ask about the title of your book. So yeah, thank you for, pardon me. Thank you for, um, for sharing that. Um, right. So at this point, uh, during, during this, your, your brain is kind of making all of these associations that aren't necessarily really there. Um, it's just, you're kind of pulling from your past to make sense of what is going on. Um, and yeah, how, long, I how long were you there? So I was in the mixed ward um, for about a day and a half, and then I was transferred to another floor that was um, all women. Mm -hmm. And I was in the hospital total for six days. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, what kind of support did you get? Um, there was a psychiatrist who came around um, once a day. Initially, I was really hesitant about taking medicine. You know, they, they wanted to put me on a medicine right away. And in the past, I have had some pretty negative reactions when starting new medicine. So I was very hesitant about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it took a couple of days before they convinced me to start taking it. Um, I don't think that there were really any kind of supports in place on the first floor that I was on. I think um, I never really asked about this, but I think perhaps the first floor that I was on was just kind of the more intensive floor that was meant just to get you to some sort of baseline where you might be more receptive to therapy. So there were no um, therapy sessions or anything like that when I was on um, the mixed floor. But then once I made it to the women only floor, there were several different sessions that you could attend each day. Um, none of them were mandatory, but um, it was encouraged that you go to as many as you could. And there was um, there was an art therapy class and a music therapy class and a conflict skills class and a stress reduction class, a bunch of different options. Um, and then they also had a kind of like a quiet space that you could go to. I think they called it like the relaxation room and they had um, like some cushions and a yoga mat. And um, it was just kind of meant to be a, a place that you could go and just kind of calm down. I think they also had like crayons and coloring pages and things like that. Um, so by the time you went um, to the women only floor, did, did you experience any shift or difference in how you were feeling and what you were experiencing? Not right away. Um, when I got onto the floor, I was still convinced that I was in this, you know, experimental kind of escape room themed therapy program. Um, within the first day or two, I started, um, having additional delusions that God was trying to speak to me. Um, not a very religious person, but I thought that God was speaking to me and had a mission for me within the psychiatric ward. And I thought that that mission was, I was supposed to be representing these other women as their lawyer. So there, there were these brown paper bags that they put in all of our rooms to be used as trash cans. And I just kept ripping them up and using the crayons to write out little like two sentence legal contracts. And I just left a blank in the contract for my quote unquote clients to, you know, write in their name and sign them. And I would go into the day room and say, you know, I'm, I'm hosting office hours, anybody who needs legal representation, you know, come and talk to me. And I'm a trademark lawyer. So, you know, it's, it's not as though um, even if I were in my right frame of mind that I would be able to provide the kind of legal advice that perhaps these women were looking for. But I thought that that was what God, you know, was directing me to do. And so that's, that's what I was doing. So my, my focus kind of shifted from 
these escape room delusions into these delusions about what it was that God wanted me to do. Um, there was one woman who had been on the mixed floor with me and then also ended up down on the woman's floor. She was very religious and kept, you know, wanting to pray with me. And I thought that she was like a messenger from God and that I needed to, you know, really work with her and help her. Um, I ended up she told me that she was escaping an abusive husband and, um, you know, was trying to find a place to stay. And so I, I called one of my colleagues. Um, we were able to make phone calls during certain hours whenever we wanted. And so I actually called one of my colleagues at the law firm who I'm close with and told him, you know, um, uh, you know, I know I'm calling from an unusual number and this will sound strange, but I have this new client and I need you to book a hotel room for her and send an Uber for her. You know, she's going to be getting out in a couple days. And I know this sounds strange, but I just, I really need your help with this. So, you know, please help me out. Um, so I, you know, was trying to make all these arrangements for her. Um, Did your so colleague know or, or like get tipped off or anything that you, you weren't uh, doing well at that point? He did not know previously um, at that time, he definitely discovered that I was not doing well. Mm -hmm. um, I think he ended up calling my husband um, and, you know, was very concerned and asked him what was going on. And I think he found out that way. And I, mm -hmm. you know, later on, I, I talked to him too and told him what had happened, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that that's kind of the headspace that I was in, at least for the first couple days that I was on that ward. And I think bit by bit, it started to get better. Obviously, after I started accepting the medication, um, I started kind of coming back to my baseline. And um, but even by the time I discharged, I was still pretty manic and still having some delusions. Um, for example, I thought that there was going to be like a graduation party for me when I left the ward. And I thought that all of my friends and family members were going to be there to greet me when I left the ward. And I remember like, dressing really carefully. They they let my husband bring in some of my clothes from home so that I didn't have to just wear a hospital gown the whole time I was there. And I remember I wore this cardigan that one of my friends had lent me for breastfeeding, just like an open cardigan. And I remember thinking like, well, she's probably going to be here when I get discharged and I want her to see me wearing her cardigan. So she knows that I'm like grateful that she lent it to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was expecting like balloons and signs and cards. And I was very surprised on my discharge day when I went downstairs and it was just you know, my husband and our son and my father-in-law. Um, so at that point at what you, it was not like a perinatal specific place, but did, did they talk to you at all about what they thought was going on for you at that point? Like at any point in the, in the hospital? I don't recall them. I definitely don't recall anyone telling me um, that I was experiencing psychosis or that I had postpartum onset bipolar disorder. I remember them kind of speaking more in generalities and just say, you know, reiterating that I needed to take this medicine in order to be released and to go back home and that I needed this medicine to kind of bring me down to my baseline. Um, I also had really elevated blood pressure at that time. So they kept reiterating how important it was to get my blood pressure down. And um, they took my blood pressure multiple times throughout the day, every day. So I, I remember them really focusing on the blood pressure issue a lot. Um, and, and you said, you mentioned something that by the, you had started accepting the medication. Um, they, so I assume they were offering you a medication or suggesting it for some time. Yeah, I, I think it was about two full days that they were suggesting medication before I finally agreed to start taking it. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so then at discharge, um, what was that like for you to, to leave there and to go home? I mean, I, I was excited. Um, I was really excited to see my husband and my son. And, you know, I thought there was going to be this party for me. And I was excited to see all my friends. You know, I'm, I'm very social. I love spending time with my friends. So I was excited about that. And I kind of felt like I had, quote unquote, won therapy, you know, like I had sort of solved all the clues and I was getting out and I felt like, I had this great new relationship with God and I had made some friends in the ward and, um, you know, one of them even started referring to me as her little sister. And so, you know, I felt like this is great. Everything is going great. I, you know, looking back, I was still very manic. Um, 
but I was, um, I was excited to go home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and at what point did you go to the intensive outpatient unit? Pretty program. immediately. Um, I think I was released from the hospital on a Saturday and I started the intensive outpatient program on Monday. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So um, it just it, it, in terms of your experience of being home um, and still what, what you know now is experiencing manic symptoms, um, how were you, how are you getting by at home? I had a lot of frustrations because I had all these grand ideas about plans that I wanted. And I felt frustrated when my mom or my husband would tell me like, okay, take a break. We don't, we don't need to worry about that right now. Um, specifically, I really wanted um, to get my story out because I thought, you know, I hadn't read anything about this, you know, when I was pregnant and people need to know about this, like, I can't believe this happened to me. So I reached out to a writer friend of mine who put me in touch with someone at the New York Times. And I became very fixated with the idea of, you know, writing an op-ed or something for the New York Times. So I was focused on that, focused on, you know, other publications that I should reach out to. Um, I had also, for whatever reason, decided while I was in the psychiatric ward that my husband and I should renew our vows. Mm. So I was, you know, trying to make all these plans about a vow renewal, and my husband was very not on board with that. Mm. Um, and I just couldn't understand why he was being, you know, such a buzzkill about this great idea that I had about, you know, getting all of our friends and family together and doing a vow renewal. So I felt very frustrated. Mm. Um, I was also still. Um, I was trying to pump at the time just to get my supply back up. Um, I wasn't pumping while I was in the psychiatric ward. So, you know, my supply had dwindled. So I was trying to pump to get it back up, but I was so distracted that I kept forgetting. Um, and when my husband would try to, you know, gently remind me like, Hey, it's been a while, maybe you should pump. I would get really frustrated with him. I didn't like being told what to do. Um, he also kept trying to get me to sleep and I still, um, just felt like I didn't really need very much sleep. And I felt like it was really infantilizing for him to keep telling me, you know, that it was time to go to bed and that I shouldn't be on my computer right before bedtime. So I just, I felt frustrated a lot. Mm -hmm. um, were your, your parents still there? Yeah. My parents stayed for um, at least like a week or two after I got home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So then, uh, in terms of your experience in the perinatal intensive outpatient program, there, there, uh, just for people's reference, um, there are not a lot of them that are uh, perinatal focused, um, but there are there are a handful throughout the country. Um, what was that like uh, for you to, to go into a group of other people who might be experiencing similar things, or if, even if not similar, were experiencing distress um, in new new motherhood? Yeah. So when I initially started the program, um, like I said, I was still in a pretty manic state. And at that time, um, so it, it was a perinatal program. So everyone was either pregnant or um, within two years postpartum. And everyone in that cohort, and there were about 15 other women who were in the program with me um, during the pandemic. So we were all on Zoom. But none of the others were experiencing mania. Everyone else was experiencing um, depression, anxiety, or OCD. So they were just presenting with their symptoms really differently from mine. And I remember after the first day of program telling my husband, like, oh, like this program is so depressing. All these women are so sad. It's just like a bunch of sad sacks. And it's like awful to hear these stories. It's just such a downer. Um, and, you know, I just, I don't know if it's going to be a good fit or not. Um, but over time, as the mania waned, I started to really, really appreciate the program. Mm -hmm. um, and by the end of it, I was so invested in the program that I, I almost didn't want to leave. Um, it just felt like a security blanket for me. Um, it really was intensive. It was four days a week, three hours a day. And um, we would do a morning check-in. And then we would do two or three substantive sessions um, that were about just a range of topics, sleep hygiene, um, relationship styles, bonding, um, 
stress management, all kinds of different things, um, body, like body image issues, depression, um, all kinds of different things. And then we would do my favorite part, which was at the end, we would do this like talk time where anybody who had a particular, you know, issue that they were struggling with or something that they wanted to discuss could bring it up to the group. And, you know, the therapist who was leading the group would almost do kind of like a, a mini therapy session, but with all the other women on the line. And, you know, we could all kind of just listen to what the takeaways were and ask questions and offer support. And I, I always really liked that part. Um, and it just, it became such a part of my daily routine that I just, I was worried that I was going to kind of fall apart, you know, when it was done. And I, I was almost hesitant to discharge. Right. Um, I did, I discharged after about three months. Um, I was out of the program for about a month and then went back to work and then swung the opposite way as you do with bipolar and had um, a depressive phase and ended up taking medical leave from work for about a month and went back into the program and was in it for another month and then um, discharged and had a more successful discharge that time. One of the big benefits of being in a perinatal IOP program. It's like you said, there's very few in the country. So I felt really lucky that I lived um, in Chicago where there is one. Um, but I had access to a perinatal psychiatrist twice a week. So she was able to make a lot of adjustments to my medicine really quickly. So as soon as we determined that something wasn't working, she was able to make changes. And so I went through several different medicines in the course of those, you know, four to five months. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the number of changes where if I was just out in the real world and trying to book appointments with the psychiatrist and, right. you know, could only get in once every three months or, you know, who knows, because it's so hard to get appointments with specialists. I mean, it could have taken years for me to figure out the right um, combination of medicines, but she was able to figure it out by the time I discharged the second time. I, I felt really stable um, and I've, I've stayed that way for the past year. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I appreciate you bringing in that point. It is really, that is one of the benefits of, of IOP programs um, is the staff psychiatrist or nurse practitioner, whoever's in there, um, because it is such a delicate uh, balance, um, like trying to fi figure all of that out and to be able to have that, um, I don't know, su support or lifeline, so to speak, uh, where you know that the group has your back and the a medical team has your back and the therapy team um, is all holding space with you um, until, until whenever that is, until um, you're able to transition out. Um, gosh, I wish there were more programs like that. Um, Me too. I, I think it was absolutely critical to recovering. Um, I should add too that because, you know, I was in the program for quite a while, a total of about four months. And during that time, um, a few other women with bipolar did end up joining the program. And I remember when the first one joined, I was so just this sense of like relief and solidarity just washed over me like, oh, I'm not the only one. Like I've never heard of this happening to anyone else. I felt so alone. And when I realized like, oh, there's, you know, there's this other person and she and I, you know, we were on Zoom so we could use the chat feature and she and I would like message separately, just the two of us and talk about like, oh, this happened to me. Like, did you have any delusions like that? Mm -hmm. Yes, totally. This is what mine was. And it just, it felt so good to be able to talk to somebody else who had been there because it felt like as much as my friends and family are wonderful and they wanted to support me and they did support me, but they couldn't fully understand what had happened to me. And it just felt so good to talk to somebody else who truly understood what it was like. Yeah, that is such a beautiful part of the, the group um, experience and not something that you can really just randomly find all the time no. if you're extremely lucky, maybe. Um, but that, you know, that is one of the purposes of the group is to, to find people that you can connect with and have solidarity with and to know that you're not alone. Um, um, so I'm curious, after your IOP experience, what, what happened after that in terms of you, your healing and therapy? 
So after that, I had um, an individual therapist who was um, a postpartum support international certified therapist. So she had worked with a lot of postpartum women um, and she was wonderful. I started meeting with her initially two times a week and then um, moved down to once a week and then every other week as, as things started to progress. But she was amazing. Um, and then my other big source of support was Postpartum Support International. They have a ton of different resources. Um, the ones that I used were they had online support groups that are hyper-focused. So there are support groups for NICU moms and military moms and people with OCD and um, people with psychosis, all, all these different things. So I went to some of those online support groups. Um, Subsequently, they created a group for women with bipolar, which unfortunately did not exist um, when I was kind of initially dealing with my diagnosis and, and healing from all of that trauma. But um, that group does exist now. I'm actually one of the peer facilitators for that group. But um, I went to the, the general um, postpartum mood and anxiety disorder group, which was great. Um, they're free and they happened almost every single day. And it was just great to have other women that I could talk to. And people would often ask questions like, hey, I've been experiencing this. Like, has this happened to anybody else? And we were all just seeking validation. We all just wanted yeah. to hear somebody else say me too. Um, and it just like, it felt so good to hear that. Um, the other big PSI resource that I used and loved, they have a peer mentor program. So you can apply to be a mentee and, you know, you kind of give a background on, on your story and what different challenges you faced and they pair you with a mentor who has gone through similar challenges. So I was paired with a woman who has bipolar one disorder, just like me, um, and has two kids and had been hospitalized just like I was. And she was just an incredible source of support. I asked her a million questions at that time. I was really grappling with this diagnosis. I, I remember asking the therapist in the program when I was first diagnosed with bipolar, I kept saying, okay, but postpartum depression goes away. When is my postpartum bipolar going to go away? Mm -hmm. And it was so hard for me to wrap my head around the concept that it wasn't going to go away. This is something that I'm going to have to manage for the rest of my life. And I struggled so much with that. Sure. Um, there's so much stigma around bipolar and people thinking that people with bipolar are crazy and unreliable and dangerous. And I, it was just so out of line with how I see myself. I, you know, I see myself as this confident, successful lawyer with, you know, a great marriage and friends. And I thought this diagnosis meant that all of that was over, that it was just oh, basically a death sentence. And I was going to be living this horrible quality of life for mm -hmm. the rest of my years. Mm -hmm. And speaking to her was just so helpful because she was really stable and she had all these supports in place and she was leading a really great life. She was, you know, really passionate about swimming and she did all these races. She had a great career, great marriage. And it was just so helpful for me to see an example of somebody who had made it through what I was going through and was right. thriving. Yeah. I just, it was hard to believe that that could be possible without having, you know, a specific person be an example of that. And she right. was that example for me. Whew. Yeah, that is really, really powerful. I'm glad you were able to access that. And that, that is also a free program. Um, that it, it doesn't cost you anything to be a mentee. Right. Yeah, it's it's an amazing program. So anybody um, who is experiencing any kind of postpartum struggle, I absolutely recommend checking that out. It's so valuable. And the program lasts for six months, too. And each um, mentor mentee pair can decide how and when they want to communicate. So, you know, if you want to do a phone call once a week or you want to text throughout the week, you know, you can decide on just whatever makes sense for you. So that's that's really great. Right. So you're getting all of that validation, just which is absolutely true. You really need, we need it as humans. We need it. But uh, uh, even more so when you're feeling that vulnerable and that scared about what this means for you. Um, and to your point, like figuring out that you're going to be managing a condition um, rather than it just going away. Um, that that is that is a lot. I mean, you went through quite a bit in such a short amount of time. Um, you know, with 
uh, under six months essentially um from uh from the birth of your son to when you were transitioned out of um the iop and, and kind of back into just everyday life yeah it it definitely looking back um it, it does feel like it all happened really quickly in the moment it felt like i was never going to get better and things were never going to get back to normal and my old self was just dead mm -hmm. um but looking back now i realize like no, I, I was actually able to heal really quickly because of all these resources that I had. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And now um, you have the stability that you were hoping for. Yes, absolutely. And have like returned to your own everyday life. Everything's cool, like work and home and all that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me. And if you had asked me this, you know, a year and a half ago, I, I'm sure I couldn't have believed it, but I feel, you know, I don't feel 90% myself. I don't feel 95% myself. I feel a hundred percent myself, mm -hmm. um, which is just such a huge relief. Um, you know, I, I just feel really steady. Um, I feel like everything is under control. Um, I was able to bond with my son in a way that I didn't think I was going to in the beginning. That, that was another thing I didn't really talk about, but, um, while I was manic and just, having so many racing thoughts and inability to focus, I wasn't really able to bond with my son very well during that time either. Mm -hmm. So that was really something that formed, you know, once I was further along in my recovery journey and just to see the relationship that I have with him now, it's just not, um, I didn't think I was ever going to get to have that. Um, and I'm just really happy that I did. For sure. Um, right. And even with, you know, those first, uh, however long, a couple of months, maybe, um, where you were going through this and trying to cope and heal, um, it, you're right. There is still opportunity for connection and, and bonding and for, for the rest of you know his life and whatnot. But you, you pointed out some areas that a lot of people have uh, similar fears around, like, will I be able to connect with my child? And also if I'm taking medications, will I, will I still feel like myself? Um, there's certainly plenty of fear and, and stigma related to medications um, psychiatric medications in particular, like if, if you were dealing with, um, uh, you know, an intense, an intense type of like diabetes or something and you need medication, you would, you would take that, um, with, without the hesitation necessarily that we do with, um, mental health conditions. Um, so that like the stigma, uh, that you also had, uh, like internalized stigma, things you'd heard about, you know, medication and, and all this stuff, um, it's a lot to try and, and wrap your head around and, and push through, move through in order to get to the healing that you had. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, especially with, you know, this idea that I was going to need to take medicine for the rest of my life. That was a really hard idea for me to grasp. I sort I, I felt like, you know, I ought to be able to manage this by myself. I should be stronger mm -hmm. than that. But, you know, over time and with <laughs> lots of therapy, I, I came to realize that medicine doesn't make me feel like I can't be myself. It's the opposite. It's the thing that does let me be myself because it takes away those symptoms that are not me, you know, going into fits of rage is not me. Um, having all these delusions is not me. Um, being unable to sleep is not me, you know, and, and the medicines take all that away so that I can actually get back to myself. And so, it, I mean, it's the medicine that lets me be myself again. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. At what point did you decide to write your book? So the book actually started out just as journaling. Um, I was out of the IOP program, um, but was still kind of at the tail end of maternity leave. And I started journaling just as a way to kind of process everything that had happened. So many things had happened to me in such a short period of time that I was just trying to kind of get it out of my brain and onto paper. And um, I really like to write. I've always loved writing, but I hadn't done any sort of creative writing since I was in law school. I took a creative writing class when I was in law school, but that was, you know, 11 or 12 years ago. So it had been a long time and I just found myself really enjoying the writing prospect and also just the habit of it. Um, I went back to work and I started writing 
for 30 minutes before work every day. And then on Saturdays, I would take an hour or two and go to a coffee shop and write. And after I did this for, you know, maybe a month or two, I started thinking, you know, maybe this is a story that's worth sharing. It's a story that I would have loved to read when I first got home from the hospital. And I felt so isolated. I felt like I was the only person who had gone through something like this. Um, I had never heard of postpartum onset bipolar disorder. I didn't know it was a possibility. I felt kind of like a freak of nature, honestly, that this thing had happened to me. And I, I came home and I looked for firsthand accounts of other people who had gone through this and I didn't really find anything. Um, or I, I found very little and I thought, you know, maybe it would be helpful if I could share my story for a few reasons, you know, to give that sense of solidarity that, you know, that moment that I got from group therapy of hearing somebody else say me too, and just what a relief it was to know that you're not the only person. And also to know that there's hope that there's recovery that you, that you do get to go back to being yourself. Um, and that going through something postpartum, whether it be postpartum onset bipolar or something else, like that's not the end all be all of your life. That's not going to define you. So I, I want people to know that too. Right. For sure. So with, with throughout the, uh, your memoir is kind of uh, your journal entries. Um, so I assume it would show kind of your, your progress through, um, from, from the suffering you were having to the, the healing that you found. Yeah. So another thing that I really wanted to do was kind of shed some light on what being manic feels like, because that was also something that I was trying to find more information about when I got out of the hospital and just not finding much. Um, so the memoir actually chronicles kind of the two week period when I was going through this manic phase. And then it has an epilogue that flashes forward to present time and talks about um, my recovery and what that looked like and what the different resources were that I used and kind of how I got back to being myself again. That's awesome. So I know we're sharing a bit of your story here today. And I know you um, said there were so many other things that you went through and that had, that had happened that you had to overcome. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm really glad that you're, you're writing in that way or that you wrote in that way to help people understand what it feels like, because it's so, it, you know, speaking clinically, like this is the symptom and, and all that and making it very clinical, it, you still can't quite translate that into, oh well, yeah, that's happening to me. Um, it sounds very distant in a way, just to hear symptoms. Yeah, I think that's right. What I wanted was just to read about, you know, what did what did a delusion feel like to somebody else? Or like, what did it feel like inside your brain when you're experiencing just this inability to focus on anything? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what did it feel like for other people? Because I just so desperately wanted to feel like I wasn't alone and like somebody else had experienced the same thing that I had experienced. That's awesome. So you put a lot of work into this um, and I know it's gonna be coming out soon. Um, so can you tell people a little bit about where they might be able to find it? Sure. Um, so it's going to be coming out in late January or early February. Um, it's currently available for pre-order. Um, the, the link is a little bit unwieldy, so I think maybe it'll be in the show notes, but mm -hmm. it's jessica -ekhoff, e -k -h -o -f -f dot presale dot manuscripts dot com. And um, on that website, there's also a trailer that you can watch that kind of um, gives a little bit of a preview of the book. And there's some more information about my story on that website. Um, but yeah, the book will be out um, in ebook and also soft cover late January, early February. Of 2023. Yes. Um, fantastic. So if in the meantime, um, people wanted to follow you or stay connected, where can they go? Sure. So I'm on Instagram, although fair warning, I don't post that often, but I do <laughs> respond to DMs. Um, it's just my name, Jessica Eckhoff, E-K-H-O-F-F, -F -F, like Frank. Um, that's the benefit of having an unusual last name. You can just get <laughs> your your name with nothing else as, as your handle. So you can find me there. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this bit of your story. And I really look forward to reading more and uh, for the listeners to really 
be able to understand um, from your perspective what it's like, but also to be able to um, have that expand and understand other people's experiences as well, which ultimately brings more compassion. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. And I, I told you this before we started recording, but I'll say it again. Thank you so much for all the time that you take making this podcast. I listened to it all the time when I was on maternity leave and it was another big source of comfort and solidarity for me. So thank you. You're so very welcome. To connect with Jessica and find out more about her memoir, Super Sad Unicorn, a memoir of mania, you can find her on Instagram at Jessica Eckhoff. And again, you can find her book for pre-sale and for order after it releases at Jessica dash Eckhoff dot presale dot manuscripts dot com. And if you know anyone who is experiencing bipolar disorder, especially in the postpartum period or even during pregnancy, you can send them to Postpartum Support International in the Get Help section, and they can find the resource for the online support group. And this is absolutely something that you do not need to go through alone. There is help available. There are loads of us therapists and support people who know what these symptoms are and can help guide you through your healing and help you to feel better. As you can hear from Jessica's story, understanding what the experience is like of someone can really help us bring compassion and understanding to their experience. And that's what everybody needs. That's what we can offer as well as professional support. But we have to absolutely have to reduce the stigma make it go away so that the people who are suffering can get adequate help and support and not have to deal with the additional layer of guilt or shame that other people are putting on them or that they've internalized from thinking that uh, mental health conditions are some sort of bad thing that are only happening to them. The truth is, is that this is happening to a lot of people and we know this, we know this now. So we can do better and we are doing better. For anyone who needs help or support, go to postpartum.net. Thank you so much for being with us. Until next time.